Section 19 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 19, Part 3 of The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins, a continuation of the second narrative, The Hustler's Story, told by himself. If you have ever felt the heartache, you will know what I suffered in secret when my mother took my hand and said, I am sorry, Francis, that your night's rest has been disturbed through me. I gave her the medicine and I waited by her till the pains abated. My aunt Chance went back to her bed, and my mother and I were left alone. I noticed that her writing desk, moved from its customary place, was in the bed by her side. She saw me looking at it. "'This is your birthday, Francis,' she said. "'Have you anything to tell me?' I had so completely forgotten my dream that I had no notion of what was passing in her mind when she said those words. For a moment there was a guilty fear in me that she suspected something. I turned away my face and said, No, mother, I have nothing to tell. She signed to me to stoop down over the pillow and kiss her. God bless you, my love, she said, and many happy returns of the day. She patted my hand and closed to weary eyes and little by little fell off peaceably into sleep. I stole downstairs again. I think the good influence of my mother must have followed me down. At any rate, this is true. I stopped with my hand on the closed kitchen door and said to myself, Suppose I leave the house and leave the village without seeing her or speaking to her more. Should I really have fled from temptation in this way if I had been left to myself to decide? Who can tell? As things were, I was not left to decide. While my doubt was in my mind, she heard me and opened the kitchen door. My eyes and her eyes met. That ended it. We were together, unsuspected and undisturbed, for the next two hours time enough for her to reveal the secret of her wasted life, time enough for her to take possession of me as her own, to do with me as she liked. It is needless to dwell here on the misfortunes which had brought her low. They are misfortunes too common to interest anybody. Her name was Alicia Warlock. She had been born and bred a lady. She had lost her station, her character, and her friends. Virtue shuddered at the sight of her, and vice had got her for the rest of her days. Shocking and common, as I told you. It made no difference to me. I have said it already. I say it again. I was a man bewitched. Is there anything so very wonderful in that? Just remember who I was. Among the honest women in my own station in life, where could I have found the like of her? Could they walk as she walked, and look as she looked? When they gave me a kiss, did their lips linger over it as hers did? Had they her skin, her laugh, her foot, her hand, her touch? She never had a speck of dirt on her. I tell you, her flesh was a perfume. When she embraced me, her arms folded round me like the wings of angels, and her smile covered me softly with its light like the sun in heaven. I leave you to laugh at me or to cry over me, just as your temper may incline. I am not trying to excuse myself. I am trying to explain. You are gentlefolks. What dazzled and maddened me is everyday experience to you. Fallen or not, angel or devil, it came to this. She was a lady, and I was a groom. 
Before the house was astir, I got her away, by the workmen's train, to a large manufacturing town in our parts. Here, with my savings and money to help her, she could get her outfit of decent clothes and her lodging among strangers who asked no questions so long as they were paid. Here, now on one pretense and now on another, I could visit her, and we could both plan together what our future lives were to be. I need not tell you that I stood pledged to make her my wife. A man in my station always marries a woman of her sort. Do you wonder if I was happy at this time? I should have been perfectly happy, but for one little drawback. It was this. I was never quite at my ease in the presence of my promised wife. I don't mean that I was shy with her, or suspicious of her, or ashamed of her. The uneasiness I am speaking of was caused by a faint doubt in my mind whether I had not seen her somewhere before the morning when we met at the doctor's house. Over and over again I found myself wondering whether her face did not remind me of some other face. What other, I never could tell. This strange feeling, this one question that could never be answered, vexed me to a degree that you would hardly credit. It came between us at the strangest times, oftenest, however, at night, when the candles were lit. You have known what it is to try and remember a forgotten name, and to fail, such as you may, to find it in your mind. That was my case. I failed to find my lost face, just as you failed to find your lost name. In three weeks we had talked matters over, and had arranged how I was to make a clean breast of it at home. By Alicia's advice, I was to describe her as having been one of my fellow servants during the time I was employed under my kind master and mistress in London. There was no fear now of my mother taking any harm from the shock of a great surprise. Her health had improved during the three weeks' interval. On the first evening, when she was able to take her old place at tea-time, I summoned my courage and told her I was going to be married. The poor soul flung her arms around my neck and burst out crying for joy. Oh, Francis, she says, I am so glad you will have somebody to comfort you and care for you when I am gone. As for my Aunt Chance, you can anticipate what she did without being told. Ah, me, if there had been really any prophetic virtue in the cards, what a terrible warning they might have given us that night. It was arranged that I was to bring my promised wife to dinner at the cottage on the next day. I own I was proud of Alicia when I led her into our little parlour at the appointed time. She had never, to my mind, looked so beautiful as she looked that day. I never noticed any other woman's dress. I noticed hers as carefully as if I had been a woman myself. She wore a black silk gown with plain collar and cuffs, and a modest lavender-colored bonnet with one white rose in it placed at the side. My mother, dressed in her Sunday best, rose up all in a flutter to welcome her daughter-in-law that was to be. She walked forward a few steps, half smiling, half in tears. She looked Alicia full in the face, and suddenly stood still. Her cheeks turned white in an instant. Her eyes stared in horror. Her hands dropped helplessly at her sides. She staggered back and fell into the arms of my aunt, standing behind her. It was no swoon. She kept her senses. Her eyes turned slowly from Alicia to me. Francis, she said, does that woman's face remind you of nothing? Before I could answer, she pointed to a writing desk on the table at the fireside. Bring it, she cried, bring it. At the same moment I felt Alicia's hand on my shoulder, and saw Alicia's face red with anger, and no wonder. What does this mean, she asked. Does your mother want to insult me? I said a few words to quiet her. What they were, I don't remember. I was so confused and astonished at the time. Before I had done, I heard my mother behind me. My aunt had fetched her desk. She had opened it. She had taken a paper from it, step by step, helping herself along by the wall, 
she came nearer and nearer with the paper in her hand she looked at the paper she looked in alicia's face she lifted the long loose sleeve of her gown and examined her hand and arm i saw fear suddenly take the place of anger in alicia's eyes she shook herself free of my mother's grasp bad she said to herself and francis never told me with those words she ran out of the room i was hastening out after her when my mother signed to me to stop she read the words written on the paper while they fell slowly one by one from her lips she pointed toward the open door light gray eyes with a droop in the left eyelid flaxen hair with a gold yellow streak in it white arms with a down upon them little lady's hand with a rosy red look about the fingernails the dream woman francis the dream woman something dark in the parlor window as those words were spoken i looked sidelong at the shadow alicia warlock had come back she was peering in at us over the low window blind there was the fatal face which had first looked at me in the bedroom of the lonely inn there resting on the window blind was the lovely little hand which had held the murderous knife i had seen her before we met in the village the dream woman the dream woman i expect nobody to approve of what i have next to tell of myself in three weeks from the day when my mother had identified her with the woman of the dream i took alicia warlock to church and made her my wife i was a man bewitched again and again i say it i was a man bewitched during the interval before my marriage our little household at the cottage was broken up my mother and my aunt quarrelled my mother believing in the dream entreated me to break off my engagement my aunt believing in the cards urged me to marry this difference of opinion produced a dispute between them in the course of which my aunt chance quite unconscious of having any superstitious feelings of her own actually set out the cards which prophesied happiness to me in my married life and ask my mother how anybody but a blinded heathen could be fool enough after seeing these cards to believe in a dream this was naturally too much for my mother's patience hard words followed on either side mrs chance returned in a dudgeon to her friends in scotland she left me a written statement of my future prospects as revealed by the cards and with it an address at which a post office order would reach her the day was not that far off she remarked when francie might remember what he owed to his aunt chance maintaining her ain unblemished widowhood on thirty pounds a year having refused to give her sanction to my marriage my mother also refused to be present at the wedding or to visit alicia afterwards there was no anger at the bottom of this conduct on her part believing as she did in this dream she was simply in mortal fear of my wife i understood this and i made allowances for her not a cross word passed between us my one happy remembrance now though i did disobey her in the matter of my marriage is this i loved and respected my good mother to the last as for my wife she expressed no regret at the estrangement between her mother-in-law and herself by common consent we never spoke on that subject we settled in the manufacturing town which i have already mentioned and we kept a lodging house my kind master at my request granted me a lump sum in place of my annuity this put us into a good house decently furnished for a while things went well enough i may describe myself at this time of my life as a happy man my misfortunes began with the return of the complaint with which my mother had already suffered the doctor confessed when i asked him the question that there was danger to be dreaded this time naturally after hearing this i was a good deal away at the cottage naturally also i left the business of looking after the house in my absence to my wife little by little i found her beginning to alter toward me while my back was turned 
she formed acquaintances with people of the doubtful and dissipated sort. One day I observed something in her manner which forced the suspicion on me that she had been drinking. Before the week was out, my suspicion was a certainty. From keeping company with drunkards, she had grown to be a drunkard herself. I did all a man could do to reclaim her. Quite useless. She had never really returned the love I felt for her. I had no influence. I could do nothing. My mother, hearing of this last worst trouble, resolved to try what her influence could do. Ill as she was, I found her one day dressed to go out. I am not long for this world, Francis, she said. I shall not feel easy on my deathbed, unless I have done my best to the last to make you happy. I mean to put my own fears and my own feelings out of the question and go with you to your wife, and try what I can to reclaim her. Take me home with you, Francis. Let me do all I can to help my son before it is too late. How could I disobey her? We took the railway to the town. It was only half an hour's ride. By one o'clock in the afternoon we reached my house. It was our dinner hour, and Alicia was in the kitchen. I was able to take my mother quietly into the parlour, and then to prepare my wife for the visit. She had drunk but little at that early hour, and luckily the devil in her was tamed for the time. She followed me into the parlour, and the meeting passed off better than I had ventured to forecast, with this one drawback, that my mother, though she tried hard to control herself, shrank from looking my wife in the face when she spoke to her. It was a relief to me when Alicia began to prepare the table for dinner. She laid the cloth, brought in the bread tray, and cut some slices for us from the loaf. Then she returned to the kitchen. At that moment, while I was still anxiously watching my mother, I was startled by seeing the same ghastly change pass over her face which had altered it in the morning when Alicia and she first met. Before I could say a word, she started up with a look of horror. Take me back! Home, home again, Francis. Come with me, and never go back more. I was afraid to ask for an explanation. I could only sign her to be silent, and helped her quickly to the door. As we passed the bread tray on the table, she stopped and pointed to it. Did you see what your wife cut the bread with, she asked? No, mother, I was not noticing. What was it? Look. I did look. A new clasp-knife with a buckhorn handle lay with the loaf in the bread tray. I stretched out my hand to possess myself of it. At the same moment there was a noise in the kitchen, and my mother caught me by the arm. The knife of the dream! Francis, I'm faint with fear! Take me away before she comes back! I couldn't speak to comfort or even to answer her. Superior as I was to superstition, the discovery of the knife staggered me. In silence I helped my mother out of the house and took her home. I held out my hand to say good-bye. She tried to stop me. Don't go back, Francis, don't go back. I must get the knife, mother. I must go back by the next train. I held to that resolution. By the next train I went back. My wife had, of course, discovered our secret departure from the house. She had been drinking. She was in a fury of passion. The dinner in the kitchen was flung under the grate, the cloth was off the parlour table. Where was the knife? I was foolish enough to ask for it. She refused to give it to me. In the course of the dispute between us which followed, I discovered that there was a horrible story attached to the knife. It had been used in a murder years since, and had been so skilfully hidden that the authorities had been unable to produce it at the trial. By help of some of her disreputable friends, my wife had been able to purchase this relic of a bygone crime. Her perverted nature set some horrid, unacknowledged value on the knife. Seeing there was no hope of getting it by fair means, I determined to search for it later in the day in secret. The search was unsuccessful. Night came on, and I left the house to walk about the streets. You will understand what a broken man I was by this time, 
when I tell you I was afraid to sleep in the same room with her. Three weeks passed. Still she refused to give up the knife, and still that fear of sleeping in the same room with her possessed me. I walked about at night, or dozed in the parlor, or sat watching by my mother's bedside. Before the end of the first week in the new month, the worst misfortune of all befell me. My mother died. It wanted then but a short time to my birthday. She had longed to live till that day. I was present at her death. Her last words in this world were addressed to me. Don't go back, my son. Don't go back. I was obliged to go back, if it was only to watch my wife. In the last days of my mother's illness, she had spitefully added a sting to my grief by declaring she would assert her right to attend the funeral. In spite of all that I could do or say, she held to her word. On the day appointed for the burial, she forced herself, inflamed and shameless with drink, into my presence, and swore she would walk in the funeral procession to my mother's grave. This last insult, after all I had gone through already, was more than I could endure. It maddened me. Try to make allowances for a man beside himself. I struck her. The instant the blow was dealt, I repented it. She crouched down, silent in a corner of the room, and eyed me steadily. It was a look that cooled my hot blood in an instant. There was no time now to think of making atonement. I could only risk the worst, and make sure of her till the funeral was over. I locked her into her bedroom. When I came back, after laying my mother in the grave, I found her sitting by the bedside, very much altered in look and bearing, with a bundle on her lap. She faced me quietly. She spoke with a curious stillness in her voice, strangely and unnaturally composed in look and manner. No man has ever struck me yet, she said. My husband shall have no second opportunity. Set the door open and let me go. She passed me and left the room. I saw her walk away up the street. Was she gone for good? All that night I watched and waited. No footstep came near the house. The next night, overcome with fatigue, I lay down on the bed in my clothes, with the door locked, the key on the table, and the candle burning. My slumber was not disturbed. The third night, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth passed, and nothing happened. I lay down on the seventh night, still suspicious of something happening, still in my clothes, still with the door locked, the key on the table, and the candle burning. My rest was disturbed. I awoke twice without any sensation of uneasiness. The third time, that horrid shivering of the night at the lonely inn, that awful sinking pain at the heart, came back again and roused me in an instant. My eyes turned to the left-hand side of the bed. And there stood, looking at me, the dream woman again? No, my wife, the living woman with the face of the dream and the attitude of the dream, the fair arm up, the knife clasped in the delicate white hand. I sprang upon her in the instant, but not quickly enough to stop her from hiding the knife. Without a word from me, without a cry from her, I pinioned her in a chair. With one hand I felt up her sleeve, and there, where the dream woman had hidden the knife, my wife had hidden it, the knife with the buckhorn handle that looked like new. What I felt when I made that discovery I could not realize at the time and I can't describe it now. I took one steady look at her with the knife in my hand. You meant to kill me, I said. Yes, she answered. I meant to kill you. She crossed her arms over her bosom and stared me coolly in the face. I shall do it yet, she said, with that knife. I don't know what possessed me. I swear to you I am no coward. And yet I acted like a coward. The horrors got hold of me. I couldn't look at her. I couldn't speak to her. I left her with the knife in my hand and went out into the night. 
there was a bleak wind abroad and the smell of rain was in the air the church clocks chimed the quarter as i walked beyond the last house in the town i asked the first policeman i met what hour that was of which the quarter had just been struck the man looked at his watch and answered two o'clock two in the morning what day of the month was this day that had just begun i reckoned it up from the date of my mother's funeral the horrid parallel between the dream and the reality was complete it was my birthday had i escaped the mortal peril which the dream foretold or had i only received a second warning as that doubt crossed my mind i stopped on my way out of the town the air had revived me i felt in some degree like my own self again after a little thinking i began to see plainly the mistake i had made in leaving my wife free to go where she liked and to do as she pleased i turned instantly and made my way back to the house it was still dark i had left the candle burning in the bedchamber when i looked up at the window of the room now there was no light in it i advanced to the house door on going away i remembered to have closed it on trying it now i found it open i waited outside never losing sight of the house till daylight then i ventured indoors listened and heard nothing looked into the kitchen scullery parlor and found nothing went up at last into the bedroom it was empty a picklock lay on the floor which told me how she had gained entrance in the night and that was the one trace i could find of the dream woman i waited in the house till the town was astir for the day and then i went to consult a lawyer in the confused state of my mind at the time i had one clear notion of what i meant to do i was determined to sell my house and leave the neighborhood there were obstacles in the way which i had not counted on i was told i had creditors to satisfy before i could leave i who had given my wife the money to pay my bills regularly every week inquiry showed that she had embezzled every farthing of the money i had entrusted to her i had no choice but to pay over again placed in this awkward position my first duty was to set things right with the help of my lawyer during my forced sojourn in the town i did two foolish things and as a consequence that followed i heard once more and heard for the last time of my wife in the first place having got possession of the knife i was rash enough to keep it in my pocket in the second place having something of importance to say to my lawyer at a late hour of the evening i went to his house after dark alone and on foot i got there safely enough returning i was seized on from behind by two men dragged down a passage and robbed not only of the little money i had about me but also of the knife it was the lawyer's opinion as it was mine that the thieves were among the disreputable acquaintances formed by my wife and that they had attacked me at her instigation to confirm this view i received a letter the next day without date or address written in alicia's hand the first line informed me that the knife was back again in her possession the second line reminded me of the day when i struck her the third line warned me that she would wash out the stain of that blow in my blood and repeated the words i shall do it with the knife these things happened a year ago the law laid hands on the men who had robbed me but from that time to this the law has failed completely to find a trace of my wife my story is told when i had paid the creditors and paid the legal expenses i had barely five pounds left out of the sale of my house and i had the world to begin over again some months since drifting here and there i found my way to underbridge the landlord of the inn had known something of my father's family in times past he gave me all he had to give my food and shelter in the yard except on market days there's nothing to do in the coming winter the inn is to be shut up 
and I shall have to shift for myself. My old master would help me if I applied to him, but I don't like to apply. He has done more for me already than I deserve. Besides, in another year, who knows, but my troubles may all be at an end. Next winter will bring me nigh to my next birthday, and my next birthday may be the day of my death. Yes, it's true. I sat up all last night, and I heard two in the morning strike, and nothing happened. Still, allowing for that, the time to come is a time I don't trust. My wife has got the knife. My wife is looking for me. I am above superstition, mind. I don't say I believe in dreams. I only say Alicia Warlock is looking for me. It is possible I may be wrong. It is possible I may be right. Who can tell? End of section 19, part 3 of The Dream Woman. Recording by Leonard Wilson, Springfield, Ohio.